Greg Pallast, welcome back to the program. Glad to be with you again. Greg Pallast is a world-famous investigative reporter whose news-breaking stories appear on BBC Television, The Guardian, Rush Today, and Al Jazeera. Uh, Greg Pallast is the author of the New York Times bestsellers Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, Armed Madhouse, and the highly acclaimed Vulture's Picnic. You can read his reports and learn more about Greg at gregpallast.com. Greg, you're an alumni to the program. Is this your fourth time on the show? But it's been over a year since your last appearance. In a nutshell, what have you been doing with yourself for the past year or so? Ah, well, what I've been doing is, uh, you know, investigating the bad guys. For those who don't know Greg Pallast, I'm kind of an old-fashioned gumshoe investigative reporter. I mean, I do that for, uh, you know, like you say, The Guardian, BBC. Now I've added Al Jazeera as an outlet, based on terrorist TV, as it's called. And... Um, and what I don't do is American mainstream because news is kind of, um, as uh, Asia Times said, I, I'm the most important newsman who's persona non grata in my own country's newsroom. So there you go. Um, but thank you for allowing my voice back in over the electronic Berlin Wall, you know. So if they don't catch us before the end of the broadcast, we can get some info out. You don't consider BBC to be a mainstream outlet? Oh, it, it is. It's just it's America is, is what's not in the mainstream. Uh, America, uh, news ganda, uh, the propaganda we get, um, you know, it's not just, you know, that's why I have to laugh when Brian Williams had to resign over making up a story uh, about the war in Iraq. The entire network did nothing but make up stories about the war in Iraq. <laughs> you know, the whole thing was fiction, you know. Um, it was uh, so, you know, like wise fire Brian Williams, you know. Uh, um, you know, we were, uh, so anyway, but uh, yeah, so, yeah, so what I've been working on are various things. Uh, every, I'm always following the money, which means following the oil and following uh, issues of vote theft as well, you know, because um, the, the one thing uh, um, that, we used to have that I sorely miss uh, in America is uh, democracy, you know, where they counted all the votes. So I've been I've been doing those investigations, and again, uh, following the the story of of uh, oligarchy in America. You recently did a story called "How Bush Won the War in Iraq." Please explain. Ah, well, yeah. Uh, what happened is that um, you know a lot of people believe that we went to, invaded Iraq to get its oil. In which case, of course, we lost, we lost because we didn't get the oil. The, you know, the oil fields have been inflamed, and for the most part, Iraq has just barely now gotten up to where it was in terms of oil production under Saddam. So it does seem like we had a disaster. That's not true. Remember, Bush and the, the, uh, the acting president, Dick Cheney, were oil men. And here's the rule of oil, the, the market for oil. The less oil, the higher the price. The second rule of the oil market is the less rule, the less oil, the higher the price. And that's also the third rule. Okay. So the last thing that an oil man wants is more oil. He wants more price. That is, the less oil, the higher the price. We did the only thing that's worse than blood for oil which is what most uh, resistors thought of the war in Iraq. The only thing that's worse than blood for oil is blood for no oil. And here's what I found out. I did an investigation with the four BBC, um, the Palace Investigative Team, and by the way, for Harper's and Rolling Stone, and, you know, kind of the kind of edge of what's permitted in America. And um, I was looking for the secret documents that the U.S. government had for the oil fields of Iraq before the invasion. And we put in freedom of information requests. And, of course, at the moment in America, there's neither freedom nor information, so they turned down a request. They said that, that the U.S. government had no plans for the oil fields of Iraq if, um, in planning for the invasion. Now, of course, that's ridiculous, because if you invaded California, you'd have to have a plan for the oranges, right? You know, at you know, if you invaded Iowa, you have to plan for the corn, whether whether your idea is to seize it or not. You have to have some plan, right? So that was a lie. So we uh, so we don't take um, it doesn't exist for an answer. In fact, that usually means that it does. 
So using uh, investigative techniques, which you can read about if you want uh, in my book, Armed Madhouse, um, we were able to get our hands on the U.S. secret State Department, Defense Department plans for the oil fields of Iraq. Now, here's the thing. There wasn't one plan. It turns out that there were two plans, two plans at war with each other. There was a neocon plan, and then there was an oil company plan. And while people may think neocons are powerful, not when they oppose the oil companies, they ain't. The neocon plan was to see was in fact to seize the oil fields of Iraq and privatize them, sell them off, and ramp up the production of Iraq's oil to twelve million barrels a day from the four million that the three to four million that Saddam was producing. So you quadruple the output and you crash the oil market as we see today. But the thing is is that the oil companies if you see the, with the price of oil dropping, the oil company profits have also dropped. Oil companies are not in the business of figuring out how to get more oil to flood the market to kill off their own profits. What, so what the oil company plan was, which was drafted by James Baker, who was, if you remember, George Bush's legal counsel under junior. He was secretary of state under senior. Um, and uh, he is lawyer for, the, for ExxonMobil and for the Saudi Arabian government. And so uh, I knew that, I knew that, that that's how I got the plan, by using a little, you know, just a little bit of subterfuge to, to get a copy of the plan written by James Baker and his crew. And that plan was not to privatize the oil fields of Iraq, but just the opposite. Make sure that, that the state, uh, that the Iraq government no longer would be Saddam, but would keep control of the oil fields and the ownership of the oil fields. And that's what was done. And to keep, and the important thing was to keep Iraq in OPEC and therefore have a limit on its amount of production. So the purpose was to limit Iraq's production, not to expand, not to get the oil, but in fact to make sure that the oil stayed in the ground. Now you got to wrap your head around this. We went into Iraq to make sure that we didn't get the oil. Repeat, we went into Iraq to make sure we didn't get the oil because the oil companies did not want us to get the oil and the Saudis did not want us to get Iraq's oil because if you open up Anbar province, Anbar province is a huge amount of oil, a, an unproven reserve because it hasn't been tapped yet, which should be at least as big as Saudi Arabia's. So the Saudis did not want that and neither did the oil companies. And that's why, that's why, um, the oil fields were taken over. For example, I spoke to the president of, uh, of Shell Oil USA, who was very blunt about it. When I, when I, once I got the documents, some of these guys actually came forward and said, well, here's why we do it. Like, wake up. Okay, smell the coffee palace. <laughs> you, know, you want to know why this is? Because we're not going to flood the oil market, okay? We're not going to get rid of OPEC. We're not going to privatize the oil fields. We don't want to own the oil. What we want to do is own the oil profits own the flow of the oil. So we have what are called a profit sharing agreement, PSAs, where technically it's owned by the state, but the profit is shared. That is, we keep the profit, they keep the sludge, and that's it. That's how it works. So there was a fear that Saddam was going to flood the oil market. He was jerking the market up and down. And um, one of the key things was to, it was to jerk the jerk. He was moving, Saddam was moving the oil market up and down like crazy. And... Um, and even profiting from it, playing the oil market as he moved it. So they got rid of him. It still came down to controlling the market. It's about controlling the market. So the, the reason why Bush, too, won the, the war in, in Iraq, Bush won as well. But Bush, remember, Bush won, really won the war for the oil companies, because what's the first thing that happened after Gulf War I? We put a limit of 2 million barrels a day on Iraq which is very interesting. In other words, the first thing we did was come up with a plan that would raise the world price of oil. That's how we punished Iraq. Who is punished? Remember that if you cut the price of oil, the price of oil shot up after Gulf War I. The Iraqis didn't lose anything because while they sold less oil, they got, they got twice as much for it. We cut their production in half but allowed them to, twi to charge twice as much. They didn't lose anything. Okay. I mean, Saddam then spent it on, um, you know, 
his crazy uh, projects. Believe me, I'm, I'm not. Uh, uh, but I didn't like Saddam when he was on the Bush family payroll, and I never changed my mind about it. Okay, when when he went rogue on them. And so Bush one did the right thing for the oil companies. He cut oil production. Bush two, his the neocons really wanted to ramp up oil production, but then the oil companies came in and said, okay, no more of this neocon nonsense. We're not privatizing nothing, and that's what happened. And the head of Shell Oil was placed as head of uh, the oil uh, oil operations for the Civilian Provisional Authority. So that's the story of Iraq, and and it's still going on today. Where you know there's enough turmoil in Iraq to keep production down. Okay, that's key. Now now, now let's shift to what's happening now in the oil market. If you would have read. Uh, our madhouse, if those who read our madhouse and had enough sense to actually use it as a guide for investment, you would know that every 10 years, like clockwork, the, Saudi, the Saudis drop the price of oil by about 75%. That's what they do every 10 years. Now, in October of 2004, to help George Bush get reelected, the Saudis dropped the price of oil from, a, from $120 a barrel to $25 a barrel in a single month just before the election. Um, now, why would they do that? Because they lose all that money. The answer is two things. One, they well, they want to give their Bush a little help to their buddy, but that's minor. The main thing is, is that every 10 years, the Saudis drop the price of oil to eliminate competition for their oil. Who are their competitors? It, number one competitor is Iran, and they have to and they've done a very good job of gutting Iran's economy by dropping the price of oil. Sanctions don't mean anything to Iran. The drop in the price of oil is devastating to Iran. Second, Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela has, if you look on the OPEC website, it is Venezuela that has the largest reserves of crude oil in the world. That's on the OPEC website. Go there and look at reserves of oil of OPEC members. Venezuela has twice as much oil as Saudi Arabia. However, Venezuela's oil is super heavy, gunky oil in the Orinoco. That's what most of their oil is. That super heavy oil costs about 50 bucks a barrel to raise up out of the ground and refine. It's, it's very difficult and very expensive stuff, okay? Just like tar sands in Canada, which is the third competitor. Uh, tar sands, if you're not getting 40, 50, if you're not getting 50 bucks a barrel, tar sands is just meaningless junk. You might as well, you can use it for asphalt, literally, on the highways, but you, it's not worthwhile as a, as a fuel. The drop in oil recently, you, you, people in Alberta are losing jobs left, right, and center. Believe me, I, I live in British Columbia, that province. Yeah, over. they're getting killed. I mean, that, yeah. that's it. I mean, the, the fact, the only reason why the entire industry isn't shut down in Alberta is because once you start shutting down those pipelines with super heavy oil, and, and I think industry people listening to this will understand what I mean. Unlike light oil, where you can literally turn off the spigot. As they, so when the Saudis turn off the oil, they literally turn, literally turn spigots and they shut it off. No problem. You shut off the flow of super heavy. When that stuff starts uh, cooling down and solidifying, you've got a massive problem. You've got a tremendous technical problem with the pipes and transport pipes, everything. Uh, moving by the, well, it's not even oil, it's bituminous. Those in the industry know that, you know, it's, it's in its raw form. It's, it's not oil as we call it. It's not liquid. Um, that bituminous is a problem when it stops flowing. So the only reason you have it that they're going anyway is that they're losing money in every barrel, but it's too expensive to shut down, uh, the operations completely. But it's gonna kill every new operation. So the Saudis are knocking out Venezuelan oil. No one wants to invent in Venezuela, and it's not because they think Hugo Chavez and now his successor Maduro are crazy. It's because, and they don't like them, because, you know, that doesn't mean anything to oil guys. It's all about the fact that they can't count on the price staying above 50 bucks a barrel if the Saudis are going to, like, play this game every 10 years. And if you want to know how close this was, think about this. The oil, the, the Saudis dropped, I said, in 2004, the price of oil dropped and I said, 10 years from now, there will be another drop. I was wrong by one month. Okay, one month I was off. That's what happened. Um, and that's because the Saudis did not want to totally dump the price of oil while Obama was running for re-election. Though they don't really mind him, but, you know, they didn't need to do him a favor. 
So the big dump was in, it began earlier, but the big dump was in November, right after Obama was re-elected, you know, uh, right after um, the November elections uh, where the Republicans took over So in the U.S. So what's happened is that every 10 years you're going to have this, and 10 years from now you can put it in your calendar right now, there'll be another dump in the price of oil. Uh, it'll take two years for the Saudis this time to clear out the oil market, then it will go back up to over 100 bucks a barrel. So when oil goes down, the U.S. dollar goes up, of course, and then the Canadian dollar goes down. So the, the dollar being high, it's not due to Obama's economic policies? No, it's, it's yeah, right. You, you got the South. Basically, we've, we've revalued the dollar against the main uh, import commodity, which is oil. And like I say, the Saudis uh, do that, um, have to do that every 10 years to knock out their, their competitors and keep the price high. Sheikh Yamani actually put it very succinctly. He said, the Stone Age didn't end when people ran out of stones. The Oil Age won't end when people run out of oil. It's when they find a better alternative, and we'll make sure that they never, ever do. And of course, things like solar and wind and all that, immediately, those projects turn to financial crap instantly at, at 30 bucks a barrel, 40 bucks a barrel. So that stuff's gone. So that's why I say, you know, so, but, but nevertheless, the war in Iraq was for the general purpose of, of keeping control of the market and making sure that uh, Iraq stayed within OPEC and stayed within its limits and did not challenge Saudi Arabia for, uh, as the leader, as the um, production leader in OPEC. That will never be allowed to happen. And they're very successful. So you keep the pot boiling, you keep the, the you know you keep the spiders in the bottle, and you shake it up. So it's you know it's it's ISIS's turn to um, correct the oil market. And don't forget. And by the way, it's not a minor thing that everyone knows that Saudi Arabians are, are funding and, and supporting ISIS. You know, and so you know so and that's not because they're they're Sunnis and they're in love with these guys. They're not. It's it, you got to look at, at oil. You know. Greg, you had a recent interview with Russia Today where you discussed Rahm Emanuel's recent re-election as the mayor of Chicago and the use of uh, pre-marked ballots. Um, are you insinuating that there's corruption in Chicago? <laughs> I would never insinuate. I, I only make I only make uh, lethal accusations based on fact. Uh, <laughs> I lived in Chicago actually, and and I got to witness the the pre-marked ballot uh, game by the Chicago machine. And what I was saying is that if you want to, because uh, Rahm Emanuel basically crushed um, the opposition, the 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 uprising by the plebs and Chuy Garcia by saying uh, by with money. You know, it's like those scenes in the uh, in bad mobster uh, films where they choke the guy to death with with money, and so they they just drowned this guy. So you're saying why do they bother stealing votes? Because they Chicago has a patronage system, not a civil service system for your job. So in other words, you can only get keep your job if you're recommended by your by your machine party alderman. And if your precinct does not come in for the boss, you lose your job. In fact I remember one great story where where um, you know some guy uh, went to the alderman and they and the alderman said, well you're losing your job in the in the on um, the garbage transit department. Uh, you lost just lost your uh, your job. He said, why? He said, because your brother-in-law didn't vote. And uh, the guy said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kill the SOB. And the alderman said, okay, bring me his hand. Bring me the death certificate and you'll get your job back. <laughs> you know, but I remember, no, I remember watching the uh, pre-filled ballots going in and out of nursing homes and uh, trying to fight the Chicago machine when I lived there. I lived in Obama's state senate district when he was, uh, and then later it was Obama that uh, challenged uh, the signatures of, of a thousand black voters and knocked his uh, opponent off the off the ballot. Um, so when you talk about expression of black vote, uh, we have a president who's an expert at it. Compared to other countries, uh, how does how would you rank the U.S.? You know, I think Canadian voting is fairly legitimate. You know, maybe not so much in Sierra Leone. How does the U.S. rank? Well, it's more Sierra Leone than uh, the Sierras of Nevada and um, it, and of Canada. Excuse me. And uh, it, what we have is, yeah, no, we we have, um, you know, the U.S. The last several elections, 
In fact, the last uh, um, midterm election, which the Republican Party took control, was just a complete shoplifting job. And it, Americans tolerate it. But I, so my last book called Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, I actually went through, it says how to steal an election in nine easy steps. And um, now there was, I just did a report for Al Jazeera, um, God forbid it should be done by an American station, in which I spent literally uh, six to eight months, and I'm here with my team, not when I say me, uh, Zach Roberts and the rest of our team, um, it, uh, investigating a scheme called Interstate Crosscheck, which knocked off a million voters, almost all the voters of color, in the United States during this midterm election. And that's how the Republican Party took control. And we uncovered it, we broadcast it, and we're being nominated for any award, but no one in America saw it, so I'm gonna have to tell it to you, so maybe it'll drip across the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the airwaves and, and sneak across, the information will sneak across the border back to, uh, the victims of this crime. What it is, let me explain interstate, the interstate cross-check scam. What it is is, um, you have 27, you know, remember that voting in America is controlled by each of the 50 states. That means your local partisan politicians who are actually elected. Uh, for, and so you have 27 Republicans in charge of voting in America. 27, uh, so these 27 uh, elections officials, Republican elections officials, uh, started saying that there are people who are voting twice in two different states in the same election. Now, voting twice in Canada and the United States uh, is, of course, a crime. Uh, the odd thing is, no one ever does it, because you go to jail in the U.S., the minute you get five years, automatically, the couple people in the last decade, like two people, have been caught in the last decade doing it, they go to jail for at least five years, and, uh, and just to cast the second vote, why would you bother? Greg, you can barely get people to vote once. How can you get them to vote twice? <laughs> exactly. In fact, if you go to my website, you can actually see uh, the Al Jazeera uh, report and read it. And actually, if you're an American, you can see if, you're in, if your name, or actually, even if you're Canadian, you can see if you're on the, the, the double voting list. And uh, what it is, is so they, they said, now, since only two people have been convicted of the crime in the last 10 years, because it's, you know, who would bother? Um, the, so I looked at the list. So I said, who are they removing? So if they remove a half dozen people across the nation, I guess that makes sense. But no, they had listened to this. Six and a half million names on this target list. Six and a half million names, meaning that three million Americans supposedly voted twice. Now that would be one, that would be the biggest crime wave in American history, if not international history. I mean, it even beats, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cartels in Mexico. I mean, this is, you're talking a million people committing by the way, in concert, in one giant conspiracy, a big felony crime of voting twice. Now, who are these near do well? So I started demanding the list. Who are these? Who are these double voting criminals? And they were removing their these people from the voter rolls. In one state, Virginia, for example, we we found out that they removed over forty one thousand people from the voter rolls. Forty one thousand people actually voted twice. That's a crime. And and so the first question I asked is, why don't you arrest them? if they're committing this crime. I mean, you know, if you rob a bank, they don't close your bank account. They put you in prison if they catch you, right? If they have your name. If they have the names and addresses, obviously, of these voters because they're registered to vote. So why don't you go arrest them? So I started getting suspicious. I want to see these ne'er-do-well criminals. They wouldn't, no state would give me the darn lists. Okay, in the state of North Carolina, which had a hot, hot contest, there were 173,000 people put on this double voter list. And then they hired an FBI agent to go arrest them. And you know, so I flew down to North Carolina. I said, so how many did, did your big G-man arrest of this list of 173,000 people? And the answer was, well, none. Now, they wouldn't give me the list, but I got it anyway. That's my job as an investigative reporter. You read Greg Palace books, you, you learn that that it, when they, as soon as they say the word confidential, then, then I'll get it the next week. Unfortunately, this took six months to get, but we got it. We got those lists. So I started going through the lists. And what were the lists? It was people, first of all, they said that they had all kinds of matches, like social security number and everything else to make sure that, that 
that it was the same person voting in two states. No, it wasn't. First of all, one million people on the list, one million people on the list were matched as voting twice who had different middle names. They had, and this is, these are real cases, like, like John Cross Smith Jr. was supposed to be the same person as John Abbott Smith III. And when they had junior and senior with the same name, instead of assuming that they were father and son, it was, of course, the same voter voting twice committing this crime, and they lost their vote. Now, now you say, well, why do they bother? It's kind of random. No, it ain't. Because America had something called slavery. And the effect of slavery was that black folk in America shared la share last names and share common names. So, for example, um, there are literally, and this is the exact number, 86,001 John Jacksons in the United States. Now, it's not one guy named John Jackson voting 86,000 times. It's 86,000 people named John Jackson. Okay. So what they, and they know that 53% of all people named Jackson are African American. They know that they're black. And they know that black voters are blue voters. They vote Democratic. And believe it or not, 93% of all people named Garcia are Hispanic. Actually, what surprises me is who's the 7% of Garcias who aren't Hispanic, but okay. They're changing their name. 93% <laughs> of uh, Garcias are uh, Hispanic, and Hispanics vote 2 to 1 Democratic. And believe it or not, 97% of people named Chung are Chinese Americans. Now, and Chinese Americans vote blue as well. They vote, the Chinese Americans vote, um, three out of four Chinese Americans voted for Obama. And, but, you know, so if you, and, and we were in uh, Korea, I flew down with our crew to Koreatown in Atlanta. And there's like, and as they said themselves, they joke about it, that there, that there's, Kim, Park, and Ho, three names, that's it. Everyone is one of three names. And, uh, and they were all listed as double voters. And in fact, 25% of all the minority voters in Georgia, one in four voters in Georgia was listing as committing the crime of voting twice. But of course, once again, they don't arrest them. They just take away their vote. And that's how you had close races in in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Alaska, in Colorado, who, that were all flipped to the Republican side by removing voters of color, by simply accusing them of being double voters. In a lot of cases, they don't even know it. They just send in, you know, about uh, about uh, a fourth of all Americans mail in their ballots. And you mail in your ballot, you don't know that you've been put on a hit list and your ballot's going to be thrown in the in the dumpster. So this is how, this is one of ten tricks, man. That, that's how American elections are determined. That's one million votes in the garbage can because you've got a common name which identifies you. They're wonderful working statistics. They'll say, well, you know, there's, there's white guys named Joe Black. Not a lot of them. But it's, all, it's, it's quite sophisticated, quite sophisticated how they operate the system. Greg, you're a student of history. Um, do you remember who won the presidential election of 1876? Uh, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, no. Because was it Harrison, or was he the one who lost? I can't remember. It was Tilden who lost. Rutherford B. Hayes won. Uh-huh. 81.8% of the eligible electorate voted. Back then, actually, it was pretty common for it to be 75, 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, 55% essentially of the eligible electorate voted. Interestingly as well, New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera, possibly also Hispanic, wants to pass legislation to give illegal immigrants the right to vote in local and state elections, reports Reuters. Your comment on that? Well, two things. By the way, uh, it used to be that if you lived in, in New York, it didn't matter where you come from or whether you held U.S. citizenship. If you were a taxpayer and a permanent resident in New York, you used to be able to vote. So, you know, because you had to pay, you have to pay the taxes. You have to, by the way, residents of the U.S., uh, whatever your citizenship, have to go into the military. You're subject to the draft and you have to pay taxes, et cetera. 
and uh, so you should have some say in in the governance. But that's you know that's that's getting into the theory. I mean, one of the things is that the Republicans are using the game of saying illegal aliens are voting right now. Uh, this guy Hans von Spakovsky, and I can't make up his name, who was this? Uh, who was, by the way, appointed by a guy named Barack Obama to the National Electoral Commission to determine how to improve our voting systems. This guy says 6.4 percent of the people who cast ballots in America are foreigners, and that would be close to like nine, uh, eight million voters. Eight million voters. And by the way, that would mean that since we know that about 11 million people are, are uh, undocumented aliens in the U.S., that means that, that, the undoc- that aliens are more likely to vote than U.S. citizens, if his numbers are correct. But remember, he's the official who's setting the rules. And what they're doing is, and therefore they're doing this hunt for the illegal alien, right? The big hunt for the illegal alien. And so what they're doing is taking lists of people deported, who have names like Jose Hernandez. They go, oh my God, a guy in Florida is named Jose Hernandez, and he's still voting. So he must be an illegal alien. So they remove his vote. They accused the the governor of Florida, a guy named Rick Scott, a a, a dangerous, weasley little character, you know, who is more dangerous to uh, the uh, uh, to voters of color than any grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, I mean, really, um, I'll take a grand dragon over Rick Scott any day in terms of, of commitment to democracy. Um, and um, so he accused 181,000 citizens of Florida, his own citizens, of being illegal aliens who, you know, who are voting and began removing them from the voting rolls. In fact, so I said, once again, I asked the magic question. If you're an illegal alien, you should be arrested, jailed, then deported after you serve your time. How many people have you arrested? How many people have you jailed? Zero. How many have you deported? Zero. So you mean you, you just remove, you, in other words, you know where there's illegal aliens committing the felony crime of voting illegally, and you just, just remove their vote? You don't, like, throw them out of the country? You don't arrest them? The answer is out of 181,000 people, they arrested and imprisoned one illegal alien. A, a by the way, a Canadian-Austrian dual citizen who registers Republican. <laughs> there you go. And that was it, one. But, every, but on the other hand, why, did they, why were they removing 181,000 people? Because all, almost all of the people on the, on the hit list were Hispanic, were Hispanics. Democratic voters. See, people think, oh, well, the Cubans uh, vote for um, Republican, but that's a very small part of the Latino population of Florida. Most Latinos of Florida are Puerto Ricans who have moved to Florida. Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States. They are, you know, they're an occupied, they're, they're occupied territory. That makes them citizens of the U.S. The minute that they step on U.S. soil, they can vote. Okay, and that's what they were trying to knock out was the uh, was the uh, Hispanic Puerto Rican vote, and that's how that game was played. That's 181,000 people in a single state, and remember that the United States presidency was won supposedly by 537 votes. That's it in one state in Florida. 537 votes made George Bush president. And those who know Greg Palace writing, that's where I began my investigations of vote theft, when I found out that Catherine Harris and Jeb Bush personally, Jeb Bush, who's running for, uh, for president again, or running, uh, you know, tr- hoping to steal enough ballots to win again for his family, um, had removed 58,000 voters, almost all of them black voters, from the voter rolls of Florida, saying that they were felons, criminals, who lose their vote and were illegally registered to vote. In fact, Again, I said, you're talking felons are, are voting again? Throw them back in jail, right? That's a crime. I asked the attorney general, wouldn't you, would, you would arrest a felon who's trying to vote again? He said, of course. I said, well, you, you know, Catherine Harris knocked off tens of thousands of black people off the voter rolls. Why don't you arrest them? And he said, well, that's just, yeah, we looked at that list. I said, how many people did you arrest? He said, we opened six cases and we dropped all of them. 
six cases of potential illegal voters out of the tens of thousands that lost their vote, and that determined the presidency of the United States. And in the United States itself, they're, you know, people said, ah, they scratch their crotches, you know, um, grab their uh, remotes, and uh, nod it off to Brian Williams, to the dulcet sounds of Brian Williams and his hairdo. You're right. I actually have an audience uh, comment here. He says, uh, I have witnessed voter fraud. A guy in front of me in line barely spoke English picked a name out of the book, and gave it to get a ballot. He failed several times, changed his answer, got the addresses wrong. Finally, the poll worker just read him a name and asked, Is this you? He said yes and walked away with a ballot. Who can you report this to? There was no one at the polling place who cared. When I complained, I called the police. They laughed. There was an app, but it seemed I'll like tell a you what, I'll tell you what, that guy, you know what, this is a crock of bullshit. This is a complete lie, some baloney guy's making up nonsense to you, blowing it up your, your backside. So I'll tell you what, give me the name, I'm an investigative reporter, I'll hunt the guy down, I'll make the citizens arrest, okay? I want the name, I want the info. I want to know what, I want all the facts. And the guy has a cell phone, I assume, so he took a picture, right? And if he didn't, I'd want to know why he didn't. He'll get and, your response, and we'll see what he says. Yeah, yeah, okay. Baloney, complete, 100%. 100%. And let me tell you, and I'm going to tell you something else. I spoke with, with U.S. Prosecutor David Iglesias, a good Republican. He, hunt, he said he was given names. He hunted like a dog all over the state of New Mexico looking for illegal voters for his party, the Republican Party because they wanted to prove that they were illegal voters. He said he couldn't find one, and when he reported that back to the White House and Karl Rove, he was told, go arrest someone anyway. I kid you not. He said, they said, and he said, I can't arrest people who haven't committed a crime. They said, yeah, well, you can let them go later. He said, I can't, this is not the Soviet Union. I can't charge people with uh, crimes they didn't commit. And so they fired him. That's the story. So this guy is blowing it up your backside. Forget it. I want his name, too. I don't want no secret, no secret the deals. You know, if this is a great patriot stopping a crime, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll go arrest anyone they want. I told them, I, you know, I went, by the way, the, in South Carolina, when they said they had no double, they, they couldn't find the double voters. I said, you got their addresses. So I went and found, I found six of them in one day. And I went and said, is this, you know, okay. We're going to have you, we're going to make a citizen's arrest here. And they said, well, it has a different middle name, and, and I'm a junior, and that's a senior, and I've never been to that other state. It's baloney. You know what? I'll tell you. Let, let me tell you who, who these lists get. Okay, Willie Steen, who, unlike the president, Mr. Bush, went to war in the Gulf. But he's a black man. And it's because his name's Willie Steen, and there was some felon in another state named Willie Osteen. They told him he was a felon and couldn't vote. Now, he, he works in a hospital in Florida. You're not allowed to work in a hospital if you, have any, if you have any criminal record. And they search it really well. It's against the law. He's working in a hospital. He's a Gulf War veteran, and he was denied the right to vote. And by the way, he got an apology letter personally signed by Catherine Harris saying, I'm sorry you didn't get to vote. That was a mistake. Four years later, he's put back on the felon list. Same BS. That's who's not allowed to vote. I don't buy this. You know what? If someone has an illegal voter, let's see it. I ain't seen it yet. Okay? Are there, is it never happened? I didn't say that. You know, I told you some Canadian SOB tried to vote in Florida. I don't trust Canadians. But, you know, I mean, but when it comes to, uh, you know, people, sw you know what? The, the chance an illegal alien is going to vote, is going to give their name and address to U.S. agencies and show up at a particular spot is pretty slim stuff. Unless this person is saying that the Republicans that control the state of Florida are just too squeamish about arresting people that they consider um, illegal voting, illegal aliens. Give me a break. You know what, and by the way, it is not against the law for someone who has trouble with English to vote in a U.S. election. That's not against the law. And if they were trying to correct the, the poll workers' reading of the, of the I, was in, I was in Arizona, and I kid you not, when poll workers 
were telling people they couldn't find their name Juarez because they were looking under W, okay? So, you know, so come on. I mean, you're talking about Americans. You're not talking about exactly, uh, you know, high literacy rate. You know, don't forget, if someone's having trouble speaking English, it was probably the poll worker because they've been watching Fox News so long that they only have 11 verbs. Another question here for, this is a fucking statement, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've read this stuff before. I just want you to address it. Go ahead. Greg, mm -hmm. Greg Palast is a gatekeeper shill who happens to be related to Mossad founder David Kimchi through his father. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I am a gatekeeper. You know, before the September 11th attack, I got to tell you, there was a newsletter. And I got a, you know, I got a copy. I didn't, I didn't open it in time because I didn't have the password. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney said, you know, before we, uh, before we, we uh, blow the, the tower, um, make sure that that Noam Chomsky and Greg Palace get uh, get the word. You know, tell them to stay out of downtown. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm guilty. I did it. I <laughs> I got it. You know, I really I have the newsletter from Dick. You know, the, the warning. Hey, stay out. Stay stay away from the towers. Signed, Dick. <laughs> sure. I know. I have a, they, the first the first thing that they do is they say we're going to tell Greg Palace. Make sure that Greg Palace gets the word, and then tell him to shut up. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there's a lot of secrets. You know, I, I, I wish I was on the list. Uh, you know, that's all I could tell you. You know, I, I am suspect because I, you know, I did have. A, by the way, I did have an office in in the World Trade Towers. How about that? There you go. Add to the gatekeeper thing. I had a tower. I have an office there, and I was not there. I was a hundred miles away in Long Island. So you can add that to the file. My office went down. Really. I, yep, I was in the 50th floor of Tower 2, and I used to have another office in the, in the Tower 1. You know, voting is not in the Constitution. Uh, yeah, I know. That, that's one of the things that, in fact, uh, there's been a move. So you have no right to vote. That's something that has been uh, brought up that was actually used by the Supreme Court. You don't have a right to vote. I mean, if, there's a, if there is voting, they can't take it away from you. They can't, if, if a state allows you to vote, they can't take it away from you on the basis of your color or your gender um, or your beliefs or something like that. But uh, you don't have a right to vote in, in the United States. And, um, and obviously, uh, you know, our betters are more than aware of that. But, you know, uh, the, the, problem, the problem we have in, in the states is that there is no respect for the right to vote. Because it is, we like to think of ourselves as democracy. But when people do play games, they say, "Ha ha, gotcha." Both, you know, that this has been a, a very serious business where there is really no respect for the right to vote, and that's by either party. And right now, it, the Republicans have gotten better at. It. They've got the, the the computers and the machinery, like the Koch brothers have something called the Themis machine, and these are very, very. So they they know how to do mass purging of of votes, et cetera. But you know the the problem is that the Democrats have uh, have also joined in the party uh, in terms of you know their their partners in, in vote plunder, and for example, when I was in New Mexico, there's a tremendous suppression of the Hispanic vote, and the suppression was done by the Hispanic Democratic Secretary of State, because vote. And here's an important point: vote suppression is class war by other means. When Bill Richardson, who was a Hispanic Democrat, was the governor, and he had a Hispanic Democratic Secretary of State, they wiped out the votes of other Hispanic Democrats. It was a, it was a fight for control of the party. Bill Richardson would never win a primary, as would never be the candidate, never win a primary in New Mexico if you allowed poor Mexicanos to vote. So massive non For example... In uh, in one precinct, in, in Chavez, it was called Chavez County, they have a precinct for the all the absentee ballots that come in from soldiers. And, you know, these, this is a, a culture where people do go into the military, and they're overseas. They send in their absentee ballots. They have a precinct. According to, according to the voting officials, not one soldier voted for president of the United States. Not one. 
in his county in New Mexico. Not one soldier voted for president. They, they sent in their ballots, but they left the presidency bank blank. No one's seen those ballots. They were chucked. But supposedly not one voted for president of the United States. In the Navajo areas, you see one in ten votes just get disappear into the ether. They don't change their votes. None of this stuff where there's some guy in a, at the bottom of a mountain who pulls a switch and changes votes from Republican to Democrat or the other way. Um, the votes get junk. They call it spoilage. And these are official figures. Official figures. We have one and a half percent of all votes in America are spoiled. Don't get count. I mean, our, this is the official count. The official count. Don't get count. That's two million ballots get thrown in the garbage. If you are African American, the chance your ballot will spoil, get thrown in the garbage, is 900% higher than if you're white. 500% higher if you're Hispanic. About 2,000% higher if you're Native American. And just like in Canada, the Native vote is really very, very, very important because it's in the swing states like Colorado and, and Arizona and uh, New Mexico and Nevada. So you have um, a very, very important is that native vote. And if they can just make it not happen, make it go poof, uh, parties can get control. And I saw that in, in the Acoma Pueblo, for example, in New Mexico, where, um, uh, where I was investigating for BBC TV. And um, you had um, the vote of the Acoma Pueblo just disappeared because their names were erased in the voter rolls because they didn't, they challenged their addresses. And then they gave them what's called provisional ballots. In the U.S., if your name isn't on the voter roll, they give you a second chance called a provisional ballot. Well, it's a placebo ballot. You mail, you fill out this ballot, they throw it away. But what they really made sure they get thrown away because they said you, all the votes from the, from the Pueblo were thrown away because they said they were not sent in in the right envelope. Why weren't they sent in in the right envelope? Because the elections officials gave the Pueblo natives, the wrong envelopes. And they say, oh, you, gave, you put in the wrong envelopes, the ones we gave you. Ha ha. So all the native votes were lost. Now why? Who did that? It was Democrats who did that to the native vote. Why would they do that to the native vote? Ninety-five percent of all natives vote Democratic. Why would the Democrats knock out the native vote? Because in local elections, the local Democratic elite was very concerned that the Pueblo natives were voting against allowing a uranium mine to open up in New Mexico. Because the last time they had uranium mining in, in that area, all the fields of the natives were poisoned by the tailings runoff. So they said, you know, no thanks, we don't need to be poisoned. But the Democratic Party elite, which all had pieces of the action in the mining operation, um, thought that poisoning natives seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do, and they weren't going to let democracy and ballots get in the way of it. So, unfortunately, the reason why vote theft continues in America is it, it's a bipartisan activity, and that's what's sick. It is a bipartisan activity. At the moment, most vote suppression on a mass scale is done by Republicans against minorities, but believe me, the Democratic do it with steel with both hands, and that's one of the problems. They will, not, they will not kill off a system that keeps their local boys in office. All elections, as they say, all elections are local. All issues are local. But all election theft is local, too. No one really cares about the presidency, really. When votes are stolen, it's usually for low, uh, lower-level offices. How can minority groups ensure that their vote is counted? And is there any particular way to, to know if your vote was counted or spoiled? Yeah, um, there's no way to really totally guarantee your vote, but there's what I call kind of voting hygiene, you know, kind of. I have, in fact, if you go to greatpalace.com, you can download a poster called Seven Ways to Beat the Ballot Ban. It's, there's some tricks. Democratic Party doesn't like us giving this out, nor the Republicans, but one, don't mail in your ballot because the chance they'll throw away your ballot is extremely high. I mean, officially, something like 12% of mail-in ballots are thrown away. Uh, so don't ever mail in your ballot. They're not trying to count your vote. They're trying not to count your vote. Um, you know, if, they, if people think they're going to play with the computers when you walk in, what do you think they're going to do when you mail it to them? Uh, so don't mail in your ballot. Show up and vote in person. Second, always vote early. In America, you're, there's, they, they make it hard for you to do, but there's ways to go into the polling places and vote in the week before, the week or two before the elections, uh, the official election. 
Therefore, if you show up and they say, your name isn't on the voter rolls, you can go and, and complain, et cetera. Uh, second, register to vote. Again, now people say, I've been registered to vote for 20 years. Don't be a schmuck. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, that doesn't mean your name's still there, or they don't have the wrong address, or they don't misspell your name, and then you walk in and they say, yeah, but on the register, you know, it says you say your name is John Black, but on the voting roll it says your name is John Blart. Too bad, Mr. Blart. <laughs> you know, uh, make sure that you have what they consider proper ID. And I say, oh, I've got my, you know, I've got a state ID with my picture on it, but it's your student ID. Take out your gun license ID. That will work. Make sure you have the right ID with the right address, okay? Don't let them steal your vote from you. Make, make them, if they steal it, make them work at it. I mean, then, you know, it, it's still very, very hard to guarantee anything here. Uh, but, you know, these are some basic things. Assume that they want your vote not to count. I mean, basically, assume the theft. You know, you don't leave your keys in the car. Don't mail in. You don't mail your keys to, to the bandits. Don't mail your ballot to them, you know. Uh, you know, simple stuff. That won't guarantee nothing, but at least it will make it more difficult for them to, to jack you. They can't steal as, you know, they can't steal all the votes all the time. It's that simple. The book is Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. It was written in advance of the 2012 election, but it's still relevant for any election. Too relevant. Too relevant, <laughs> yes. How to steal an election in yeah. nine easy steps, and you were just given some tips on how to beat the ballot bandits. Uh, anything new coming out of the Greg Palast camp? Yeah, well, if you uh, go to gregpalast.com, you'll get by Monday, which is the fifth anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon uh, explosion. You'll get a little bit of the real story, including the report I did for uh, British Television's dispatches uh, on the real story of Deepwater Horizon, including the fact that the companies knew, BP and other oil companies and the U.S. State Department knew that just before the blowout in the Gulf, there was a, a nearly identical blowout for the same reasons, the Caspian Sea, and they covered it up because they covered it up. They didn't uh, take any steps to stop it from happening again, and sure enough, boom. If you want that real story, uh, go to gregpalace.com, and you can download that. You can see the report I did. And download for free. I'm going to do this especially for my uh, good friends at your program. Uh, I've decided to set up to my latest film, my last film, Vultures and Vote Rustlers, which are my investigative reports on elections and financial shenanigans, and you name it. You can download it for free. I mean, you can make a donation to our not-for-profit foundation if you want, but if you don't, you just want to look at the film and take it, no problem. I want you to, I'd rather you have the information than worry about whether we get some cash. Okay, so download it and uh, just go to gregpalace.com, and on Monday, the anniversary of the, uh, of the Deepwater Rise and Explosion, and you can download a free copy of the film Greg Palast investigates vultures and vote wrestlers. Greg Palast, always an honor to have you on the program. Thank you so much for being on the show once again. You're the best. Okay, catch you again.